data is the new oil. It's the new gold. It's something that companies use and increasingly want to have because it helps marketers figure out how to get you to buy things that you may or may not actually want. Everything we do, even this conversation, everything has a record. Everything we do generates a digital trail. We leave those little crumbs everywhere and there is always someone there to pick them up because this data crumbs worth money. Very few services are run out of the goodness of the creator's heart. One of the easiest ways to make money from someone using your tool is to collect information about them and either sell that directly or use it to show ads to those people. And this leads to the collection of very detailed dossiers about you individually, the things that you do, the things that you enjoy, and the things that you are most likely to purchase. But that's just the tip of the iceberg. What enables this targeting is what I'll call a surveillance infrastructure. And I use that word surveillance specifically because there is a power asymmetry. These companies have so much data about individuals, but individuals don't really know what's going on. The kind of perverse thing about all of this is that there's, there's this whole surveillance infrastructure, and it's not very good either. And there are a couple studies that have been done that have shown that the very you know, highly targeted advertising doesn't really generate that much more revenue either. But then it's also being used for other things beyond ads that most people are not aware of. I kind of see all of this data collection analogous to pollution. Back in the 60s, you know, we didn't know what the effects of pollution were going to be. And the environmental movement was just getting started. And people were starting to recognize what were some of the ways in the future that all of the ways that we were polluting our atmosphere and our environment could come back to bite us. I think we're in that moment now for privacy. We're very gradually figuring out what are the ways in which this data can be misused, how it can fall into the hands of adversarial actors, how it can be used to target and manipulate and uh, persuade people. The Russian government interfered in our election in sweeping and systematic fashion. Is it healthy for a democracy to go and have people receive very different, very targeted ads that are very niche to exactly the hot button issues that trigger them while ignoring the other substantive information that's out there? Is that healthy? There is no comprehensive um, federal privacy or um, data security um, legislation. The Commission has called on Congress to enact comprehensive privacy and um, data security legislation, and it remains to be seen whether or not that will occur. But at least having some rules around it and some protections that benefit us all are, I think, way overdue because we've, we've let companies run rampant in this space and as they've shown time and time again, they cannot be trusted. And it was my mistake, and I'm sorry. I started Facebook, I run it, and I'm responsible for what happens here. We are entering the information age, and the internet is a great place to move tons of information at the speed of light. The fastest growing part of the internet is the World Wide Web, an area that combines text, graphics, and pictures, and permits people to hop from place to place easily. When we were working on the web in the 90s, we weren't thinking ahead too far. We were thinking about, can I make the web useful to people? So the early web was text and hyperlinks. That's why it's called hypertext. You would follow a blue link that was uh, annotating a phrase or a sentence or a word, and you would click on it, and you'd go to a new page. And it was great. You could go back. You could find things. Pretty soon, people got tired of just text, and they wanted images as well. And that led to an embedded element that you could put in your page, but it referred to a different machine by its internet address. It referred to uh, your friend's cat picture server because you wanted to put the cute cat picture on your page, why not? That was done in 1993, and then 1994, the cookie came along, and you could think of that as a, a way of uh, saving some information in your browser for every site you visit. It was meant so when you go to your bank and you sign in, you would not have to sign in every time you went forward or back or started your browser over, because the basic protocol of the web was not designed to remember who you were. It's so-called stateless. Cookies helped the server set some state in the browser. Between the cookie and the image, you had a tracking system without knowing it. And we did this naively. We, we were saying, let's make the web useful. Let's put images in so that people can share cat pictures and seem to make them appear to be on their own pages when they're really coming from that other machine. Uh, let's make cookies so you don't have to log in all the time. Essentially, every click Every search that we do, every online interaction is recorded. And not just recorded by the company that you interacted with. The creepiest part of this is that it's being recorded by 
dozens, hundreds, perhaps even thousands of so-called third parties online. By first party, I mean the website that you think you're visiting. And a third party is any other entity that's on that site and uh, is typically not visible. You're typically not aware that you're interacting with them. You see the web page that loads. You don't see any of the details of that information being shuttled back and forth or what they're learning about you. So what we've been looking at here at Princeton is the kind of data collection that happens when you browse the web. And the way we've done that is my grad students and postdocs and I have built a bot, an automated uh, computer program that pretends to be a real user and browses the web. It looks at the web's top one million websites every month, but it's especially looking at the things on those web pages that a human user would not notice. The cookies and what are called fingerprints and various other tracking technologies. So I started uh, OpenWPM to visit the top 100 websites. This loads each website on a different window and then collects the data about tracking related practices like cookies or scripts, what kind of data is being accessed and transferred. All these are logged into a database. Most commonly, they will just place a cookie with a unique identifier so that they can track you across websites. In the experiments where we enter personal information such as email and password, as soon as you type your like, email address, it will be collected and sent to a third party. In other cases, the website will fingerprint your browser. Cookies are like writing an ID on a name tag. The website says, here's the ID I want you to use. You slap that name tag on and you can take it off whenever you want. You can clear your cookies. Your web browser can refuse cookies from certain sites. Fingerprinting doesn't work the same way. Fingerprinting is about recognizing you, recognizing the small differences that set your web browser apart from other web browsers. So sort of the way that if you go to order coffee at the same shop, the barista, who may not know your name until you give it to them, may recognize your order, they recognize how you dress, they recognize your hairstyle. They are identifying in the sense that it lets someone pick you out of the crowd. The way it works is that this company, this third party that's hidden on the site, sends a sequence of commands to your browser that causes it to draw an image, a hidden image that you would not know as being drawn on your screen. But the way that your browser is gonna interpret those commands is gonna be different based on the version number, based on various other things, even based on what is the set of fonts you have installed on your computer. Uh, when a website says, hey, try to draw this line, draw this curve, draw this shape, render this image, your web browser goes, ooh, graphics editing, that's best suited for a graphics card, and it hands that over to your graphics card. So it draws this picture and it draws it with so much attention to detail that if you ask, any other graphics card running any other version of software running on any other computer to do the same thing, it'll look just a little bit different. So if you ask the same web browser to draw the same picture again, you'll be able to, to remember who it was who drew the picture with exactly those pixels in exactly those places. It's, it looks like a biometric for the devices, like a fingerprint, but for your, for your browser. So then even if you remove or clear your browsing history, you can still be tracked. Scripts or the third party scripts we found are very like creative in like what kind of images they make your browser draw. In that case, for instance, they use a string which contains all the letters of the English alphabet so that that maximizes diversity and uses like different colors and shapes in the background. Here, for instance, we see different images used by the camera's fingerprinters. You see not only like some text, but also some like shapes, interesting shapes. So camera's fingerprinting uh, is pretty common right now. For instance, um, here, Facebook.com homepage actually makes your browser draw this like interesting script with smileys and collects it to um, fingerprint your browser. Some developer came up with this extension which visualizes the image the camera's fingerprinter collects from your browser. And again, this is an invisible drawing. You wouldn't know that it's going on, but by drawing that image and then reading it back as a sequence of pixels, it's gonna get an exact sequence of pixels back that's gonna differentiate uh, different users, different devices. Some machines could be exactly identical if you deliberately set them up the same way, uh, but your machine is probably unique amongst all the machines that are being compared by this website today over this time period. And it's enough to add you back to the data set, recognize that you're the same person who they saw on that website, or perhaps whose information, whose name, whose address, whose phone number is already known through some other data broker. 
Recently, in the last year or two, one thing we've been investigating is how third parties on web pages can, in a very blatant way, without resorting to cookies, fingerprinting, none of that stuff, just gobble up your personal data from websites. Of course, like all the websites you visit, maybe how much time you spend on them, your like mouse movements, key presses, what part of the page you interact with, all these are sent in real time on websites that use session replay scripts. And a session replay is something like a video recording of your browser screen when you're browsing a website. And this video recording is done not by the company that you're actually, whose website you're looking at, it's done by a third party. They're not reputable companies that you might have heard of. You don't know who they are, you don't know that company is recording your screen, you don't know who's gonna get access to that video. And in that process, these companies try to redact your passwords and credit card numbers and so on, so they're, to a certain degree, they're trying to do the right thing. But that redaction, doing it in an automated fashion, is technically hard, I would say essentially impossible. So they fail a lot of the time. So we've found that credit card information, health information like your drugs and prescriptions, student information, all of that sensitive information is getting into the hands of uh, third parties. There are a number of extensions you can install in your browser to protect yourself against this kind of sneaky tracking. Privacy Badger, Ghostry, uBlock Origin. If you install any one of these, they're gonna do a pretty good job of protecting you from most, certainly not all, but most of the hidden third-party tracking. So in mobile apps, the same type of tools don't exist by default. You know, your mobile device does not come off the shelf with the tools sufficient to see where data is being sent from the apps that you install. There are some, you know, base level of privacy controls on mobile apps, but we found that by and large, they don't actually work um, in many of the cases. They don't actually do the things that they're, you know, supposedly doing. Hey NBC News fans, thanks for checking out our YouTube channel. Subscribe by clicking on that button down here and click on any of the videos over here to watch the latest interviews, show highlights and digital exclusives. Thanks for watching.